and uh, away we go. Well, we looked last week at the first few chapters of the career of Luther. We looked at his education. We looked at his life as a monk. We did all of that. I won't go back over that. The indulgence controversy is those four years or so that start in 1517 with the selling of indulgences by Johann Tetzel. And, of course, that led to the 95 Theses, and that led to a series of confrontations and conflicts between Luther, culminating in the Diet of Worms in 1521 in April. And we left Luther sort of hanging there. You may recall last week, many of you were here, when he had just given his Here I Stand speech. And at that point, Luther assumed that he probably had maybe a month or two before he would be burned at the stake as hundreds and hundreds of others had been for taking a similar stand in the face of the accumulated authorities of the day. But Luther nevertheless courageously did so. He turned around, walked outside of the cathedral building in the city of Worms, and there was a large crowd outside gathered there, and they were all wondering what the outcome would be. Many of these were faithful supporters of Luther. They were praying for him. They were hoping that he'd have the courage to stand his ground, knowing the rather dismal prospects that that would spell out for him. And as the story goes, he walked outside onto those steps and gave the gesture, which was common in the German culture of that day, of a, a victorious athlete. I don't know what it was. It would be something like, you know, a prize fighter after the, something like that. So he goes out and does this gesture. But of course, at the same time, he was feeling the, the awful fear that what he had just done was probably sign his own death warrant. Even as he was standing there, some, rogue, some uh, hooded rogues, they had black hoods on their faces, on their heads, came riding on horseback through the crowd. They grabbed Martin Luther and threw him physically into, the, into a wagon behind one of them and went thundering out of town. Luther thought, this is it. He thought, I, I, he, thought he had a couple of months now he didn't have a couple of hours. He thought this was it. You know, that's how fast things happen. But as he was bouncing around in the back of his wagon and began looking around, he noticed something odd. He saw all of his Greek manuscripts, all of his academic work, his library, or at least the most important parts of it, were all in the wagon with him. And he began to suspect that maybe these guys were actually his friends, you know, and it turned out to be the case. So the uh, kidnappers of Luther on that occasion were actually hired by Duke Frederick, who we talked about last week. He was the political protector of Luther there in Saxony, the province over which he ruled in the city of Wittenberg. And Frederick, knowing that Luther was going to be in grave peril, wanted to make sure that he was somehow spirited away to a, to a safe place. And so he took him off to uh, Thuringia, which is a province of the Holy Roman Empire, and to a castle that was called Wartburg Castle. Now, those of you who were in the class last year may recall we did a little cameo discussion of a wonderful Christian woman who died at about 23 years old. She was known as Elizabeth of Hungary, and she was the wife of the nobleman over Thuringia some hundreds of years later, and she lived in this castle, Wartburg Castle. And I mentioned to you at the time that we would see this castle again one of these days, and this is that day. So Wartburg Castle, which was a great place to hide out, was the venue where these guys took Martin Luther. And he was checked into the place in a little cubicle room there and kept there for some period of time. In fact, he was there for the better part of a year. Once he arrived, he took off for the first time in years, the monk's habit, you know, he grew out his hair, it had been tonsured like a monk, and he grew it out, he put on a little bit of weight, he grew a beard, and after a couple of months, he began tentatively circulating in the community and passed himself off as Squire George. <laughs> Nobody knew who it was. And after a while, he'd go down to the local ale house and, you know, have a good German brew, and people just accepted this strange guy had shown up in their town, Squire George. He wore a sword and kind of had all of the accoutrements and trappings of that particular uh, station in life. And it's one of the most remarkable little episodes in church history. Nobody betrayed him. There were spies all over the place. 
I can't tell you the interest there was in some quarters to apprehend and dispose of Martin Luther, but for about 11 months he was holed up in this place and that's where he lived and nobody knew. He wrote letters at the time, he would sign them Martin Luther from Patmos or Martin Luther from the air or other whimsical references, you know, to his unknown hideout, but people knew he was alive because, of course, these letters kept coming, and the letters showed a fair amount of currency, so they knew that he was out there, but nobody knew where he was. So anyway, this was uh, his situation for about a year or so. The main thing that he did during this time was to translate the Bible from Greek into German. It's the first time it had ever happened. I alluded last week to the effect that it has on a language of translating the Bible into that language. I don't think I'd ever appreciated this very much myself until kind of looking at this uh, in some more, somewhat more recently, but if you look in history at the moment where a language has the Bible translated into it, it virtually always has a deeply ennobling effect on the language. The fact is that German up until this time was little more than the leftovers of a barbarian Teutonic language that had been around for many hundreds of years and with the translation of the Bible into that language, it became, it was sort of the paradigm shift that made German very much what it is today, one of the most precise and powerful languages in so many different fields just because the Bible touched it. If you want more on that, you should look at uh, material from the Wycliffe Bible translators who really do detail that in some significant degree. But uh, I think a lot of the English language and its potency has been the power of the Word of God being translated into that language way back, especially with William Tyndale, who, by the way, we're going to be looking at in a brief discussion uh, two weeks out. We don't meet next week, Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Two weeks out. We'll come back and we'll look at Tyndale in that connection. So anyway, many people would say, I don't know if it's true, but it's certainly a legitimate opinion, that uh, this is the most significant literary production from Martin Luther, the translation of the Bible into German. Meantime, back at the ranch in Saxony, things were beginning to spin out of control. Using the name of Martin Luther, there were forces there that were really becoming quite anarchic. These are sometimes called the radical reformers. They went by strange names, people like the Zwickau prophets, you know, and others who were basically taking the impulse of Luther but going way beyond anything that he would have authorized or endorsed. And so you begin to see destruction, you begin to see pillaging of Catholic properties, destruction of artwork and that sort of thing, and it was really becoming rather obscene. And Luther was increasingly troubled by it because many people were using his name in connection with these activities, and he never would have uh, endorsed that at all. And so finally he felt he had no choice but to go, go back to Wittenberg, back to his place of service, and in the middle of the night, who says church history isn't exciting? This, you know... In the middle of the night, he got on the fastest horse he could get a, get a hold of and rode through the night from Thuringia to Saxony. I don't know what the distance is, but it was enough to occupy him there for several hours. And he arrived back in Wittenberg sometime the next morning. It was a dangerous trip to make. Obviously, if he'd been caught along the way, it would have been curtains for him. But he felt he had to get back to this place and get out of this incommunicado status of his that he'd been enjoying for the last few months. There's a famous episode. He did a couple of inquiries with uh, friends of his and found out where these characters, these radical reformers, as they were called, were meeting to plot their next step, their next move. And in a kind of made-for-movies moment, he walks into the room where they're meeting, smoke-filled room, you know. Nobody recognizes him. He's a squire. They look up at him, kind of surprised. Who are you? you know, what do you want? And he says, my name is Martin Luther. I want my pulpit. And uh, it all changed right there. So, so Martin Luther reinstated his authority. And these did not go away, these kind of radical reformers. But at least in Wittenberg, he was able to reinstate a much higher degree of stability and order and balance with respect to the advances now, the ongoing process of the Reformation. But the, the, reform, the radical reformers 
still continued to be a factor, as we'll see in a moment. In fact, their involvement sort of erupted uh, a couple of years later in what's called the Peasants' War. The Holy Roman Empire, at least large parts of it, were still very much under the feudal scheme. There had been some upward mobility, there had been some developing middle class, but by far the bulk of people were living under a kind of tyranny, an unholy alliance between corrupt clergy on the one hand and corrupt nobility on the other, conspiring together to keep the vast majority of people in a kind of depressed, impoverished, slavish existence. And the spark that was ignited by Martin Luther began to inspire in some of these folks a belief and a desire that they could throw off these shackles. And the radical reformers played on that heavily and sort of preached and did demagoguery that really inspired them to an armed revolution that took place in 1524. And it's called the Peasants' Revolt or the Peasants' War. Many people thought that Luther would weigh in on behalf of these folks, that he'd throw his considerable moral authority behind it, and he did not do that. And I've read people to this day who criticize Luther, saying he sold out the very movement that he started because he didn't join in in a kind of militant endorsement of the Peasants' Revolt. But if anyone knew Martin Luther, they knew that would not be the kind of thing he would do. But he did write a letter attempting to conciliate the two sides, and the letter, I think, gives us a wonderful insight both into his personality and also into his perspective on this. So if you'll tolerate this, I'd like to read a little bit of this letter to you. He addresses himself to both sides, first of all to the princes. Listen to this. Quote, to the princes and lords, we have no one on earth to thank for this mischievous rebellion except you, princes and lords, and especially you blind bishops, mad priests, and monks, whose hearts are hardened even to this present day and who do not cease to rave and rage against the Holy Gospel, though you know it speaks the truth. You never had to wonder where he stood on things, you know? <laughs> Besides, in your temporal government, you do nothing but flay and rob your subjects until the poor common people can bear it no longer. The sword is at your throat. You must become changed men and yield to God's word. If you do not do this amicably and willingly, then you will be compelled to do it by force and destruction. If these peasants do not do it, others will. Even though you were to beat them all, they will still be unbeaten, for God will raise up others. It's not the peasants, dear lords, who are resisting you. It is God himself who resists you in order to visit your raging upon you. There are some of you who have, uh, who have said that they will stake land and people on the extirpation of Lutheran teachings. What would you think if it were to turn out that you were your own prophets and that your land and people were already staked? To make your sins even greater, some of you are beginning to blame this affair on the gospel and say it is the fruit of my teachings. Well, dear lords, slander away. You just don't want to know what the gospel is. You and everyone must bear me witness that I have taught in all quietness, have striven honestly against rebellion, have diligently held and exhorted subjects to obedience and reverence even toward your tyrannical and ravenous rule. This rebellion cannot have its source in me, but the murder prophets, these radical reformers, but the murder prophets who hate me as much as they hate you have come among the mobs. If it is still possible to give advice, my lords, try kindness first. For you do not know what God wills to do, and do not strike a spark that could kindle all of Germany. Parenthetically, it did kindle all of Germany. The Thirty Years' War, which we'll look at separately, really was a conflagration in terms of what's called the religious wars that spread through that region. And so even though Luther would heartily have tried to avoid it, it did in fact occur. I wouldn't blame it on Luther, I'm just saying as a matter of fact, uh, his prediction here turned out to be pretty close. Continuing, the first article in which they ask the right to hear the gospel and choose their own pastors, you cannot reject with any appearance of right. The other articles recite physical uh, problems uh, that are legitimate. Uh, now to the peasants, the other uh, short paragraph. You too must have the care that you take up your cause with a good conscience, 
and with justice. Therefore, dear brethren, I beg you in a kindly and brotherly way not to believe all kinds of spirits and preachers now that Satan has raised up many evil spirits of disorder and murder. These, pro these reformers again. I will not spare you the earnest warnings that I owe you. I've never drawn a sword nor desired revenge. I have begun no division and no rebellion. But so far as I was able, I have helped the worldly rulers, even those who persecuted the gospel and me, to maintain their power and honor. But I have stopped at a point where I committed the matter to God and relied confidently at all times upon his hand. Therefore, he has not only preserved my life in spite of the Pope and all the tyrants, but he has caused my gospel always to increase and spread. And now you interfere with it. You want to help the gospel? but you do not see that by what you are doing, you are hindering it and holding it down in the highest degree. So he was, you know, he was equal opportunity. He was harder on the princes than he was on the peasants, but obviously he wasn't siding with the peasants as well. Well, that was 1524. That's kind of a dark moment. And as I say, some critics of Luther have blamed him. Personally, I don't. I think he was doing exactly what was consistent with his own ethic. But nevertheless, it was a, a hard time for him. A happier occasion occurred just the following year, as I alluded to earlier, when he married Katerina Van Bora. And so this opens up a chapter that is one of the most delightful in all of the uh, aspects of Luther's life. Katerina Van Bora. She was the leader of a group of nine nuns who had indeed converted... Even though they were in the convent, they had, they had embraced the Reformation faith as they had come to understand it from the teaching of Luther, but that put them in peril, and they had to escape more or less with just the clothes on their back. It was kind of a narrow escape, and they wound up as refugees in Wittenberg. So here are these nine former nuns now who are in Wittenberg with uh, not much to do or no place to go, you know, and so Luther himself believe that uh, the, probably the best thing that should happen to them would simply for them to marry eligible gentlemen in the town. Uh, they had a preponderance of men there, and so it was kind of a happy fortuity that there should be these uh, available uh, marriageable uh, ladies. And so Luther himself undertook the task of arranging marriages. Uh, they did it a little differently back then, you know. And, uh, and so each of them happily joined with a, with a, a a man, a good man there in the town, and, and these marriages uh, were uh, uh, arranged. The one woman who was uh, kind of the hardest to match was uh, Katerina herself. She was quite an outstanding woman, very bright, and had a pretty strong personality. But Luther found, thought that he had found the right guy for her, and so he told her on one occasion that he thought this uh, kind of noble man who was quite wealthy and and, and intelligent and a strong Christian man would be the, you know, the right person for her. And Katerina said emphatically that she did not want to marry him. And um, Martin Luther, as he reports it later, said, well, Katerina, what will you do? To which she responded, I'm going to marry you, Martin Luther. <laughs> now, <laughs> Martin Luther was not opposed to marriage, but he did not think he was a good candidate for marriage because if you get my drift, he had a hard time getting life insurance, you know? He was a man with a price on his head and it was a big one. And there were plenty of people out there on behalf of the Catholic Church and the uh, state, the uh, uh, princes in general who wanted to capture him and he just felt it was almost uh, certain that at some point he was gonna be betrayed by somebody, uh, caught when he wasn't looking, you know, he just still felt that he was going to have to do as much as he could to get the Reformation going, but that he himself would be ult ultimately expendable and that God would care for it from there. So he was more concerned about the welfare of the marriage if she should marry someone like him, but she was quite insistent. And so as it turned out, she won. And uh, they did get married and he sent this little memo, this little kind of announcement to his closest friends uh, as follows, quote, in accord with the desire of my dear father, I have at last married. Because of the ugly tongues of those who would like to prevent it, I have quickly consummated our marriage. I would like to give a small, happy wedding party a week from this Tuesday, the Tuesday following the day of St. John the Baptist. I do not want to keep this a secret from you who are my dear friends and lords, 
and ask that you would help me by adding your blessing to it. And so they had a little gathering, a celebration of this uh, marriage. And this does open up one of the happiest little chapters and aspects of Luther's life that I can imagine. We know quite a bit about the sort of anecdotal and informal side of Luther through a book that's called Table Talk. And if you ever happen to come across it, it's still pretty readily available and it's really worth reading. Table Talk was not written by Luther, but it is virtually all the content of Luther's comments and sayings. What happens is he was a professor at the Wittenberg University and he would invite students over for dinner and they would have a nice dinner and then after dinner they would just sit around the table and engage in kind of a gab fest, you know, and questions and answers and that sort of thing. And Luther, of course, was given to really sometimes over-the-top comments, tongue-in-cheek, he was quite a humorist, and so they would write down this wit and wisdom of Martin Luther. Sometimes I think the quotes have been a little embarrassing in later history because sometimes they really are over-the-top, but nevertheless we get a wonderful insight into Luther's personality and especially this remarkable relationship that he had with uh, Katharina van Bora. And so what I pulled out here are just some kind of typical quotes from table talk that describe that relationship. Uh, one is this one, quote, in truth there's a lot to get used to in marriage. One wakes up in the morning and finds a pair of pigtails on the pillow that were not there before. <laughs> he gave her some very special names like my Lord Katharina. My Kathy, my Keta, which was the German word for chain. <laughs> my Rib, my Kate, they're Dr. Kate. My Lady of the Orchards and Princess of the Pig Markets. And other interesting designations. On her first pregnancy, he wrote a uh, little announcement to his friends, quote, my Katie is fulfilling Genesis 1.28. There's to be born a child of a monk and a nun. <clears throat> When, uh, when uh, Hans, their first child, was born, she said, quote, My dear Katie brought forth yesterday, the 7th of June, by God's grace, at 2 o'clock, a little son, Hans Luther. I must stop. Sick Kathy is calling. <laughs> when Hans was cutting his teeth, he says, These are the joys of marriage of which the Pope is not worthy. <laughs> He said, quote, when the neighbors laugh to see the master of the house hanging out the diapers, the angels in heaven are smiling. <laughs> you see, this is, the, this is the picture of marriage that began to flow out of this paradigm, and there were many others, even in his lifetime, that began to embrace something of that. To Hans, his little son, he said, child, what have you done that I should love you so? You are driving the whole household mad with your bawling. This is the sort of thing that caused the church fathers to vilify marriage. <laughs> he said, my Katie is in all things so obliging and pleasing to me that I would not exchange my poverty for the riches of Croesus. He said, all my life is patience. I've had to have patience with the Pope, patience with the enthusiasts, patience with the politicians, with the devil, with my family, and now with Katie. <laughs> he had uh, several children. Hans was born on June 7th, 1526. Hans Luther studied law, became a court official, died in 1575. He had a premature daughter, Elizabeth, born in 1527, died the following year. He had another uh, daughter, Magdalena, who was born in 1529. She died as a young teenager in her father's arms. This was devastating to him. He was deeply, deeply affected by that for a long time, for the rest of his life. Some of you have been through an experience like that. Martin Jr. was born November 9th, uh, 1531. He studied theology, but he died rather young and never had a regular uh, pastoral call. Uh, he. Um, died in his early 30s. Paul was born in uh, uh, 1533, became a physician. And finally, uh, Margarita, born December 17th, married a Prussian nobleman and uh, died only at the age of 36, but had children who actually can trace their family tree. In other words, the descendants can trace their family tree back to hers. So there are continue to be living descendants of uh, Martin Luther in the world to this day. He had a delightful relationship with his children, and just a little kind of glimpse of this is in this letter that he wrote to his son Hans when Hans was four years old. 
My beloved son, Hans Luther at Wittenberg, grace and peace in Christ. My beloved son, I'm pleased to hear that you are doing well in your studies and that you are praying diligently. Continue to do so, my son. When I return home, I will bring you a present from the fair. I know of a pretty, gay, and beautiful garden where there are many children wearing golden robes. They pick up fine apples, pears, cherries, and palms under the trees, and they sing, jump, and are happy all the time. They also have nice ponies with golden reins and silver saddles. I asked the owner of the garden who the children were. He replied, these are the children who love to pray and learn their lessons and who are good. Then I said, dear sir, I also have a son. His name is Hans Luther. May he enter the garden and eat of the fine apples and pears and ride on those pretty horses and play with the other children? The man answered, if he likes to pray and study and is good, he may enter the garden and also Lippus and Jost, who were cousins. And when they are all together, they will get whistles, drums, lutes, and other musical instruments. They will dance and shoot little crossbows. And he showed me a lovely lawn in the garden, all ready for dancing, and many gold whistles and drums and fine silver crossbows were hanging there. But it was still early in the morning, uh, so early that the children had not yet eaten, and so I could not wait for the dancing. So I said to the man, Dear sir, I must hurry away and write about all of this to my dear little son Hans and tell him to pray, study, and be good in order that he may get into this garden. He has an Aunt Lena, and he must bring her along also. By all means, said the man, go and write him accordingly. Therefore, dear Hans, continue to learn your lessons and pray, and tell Lippus and Yost to pray too, so that all of you may get to go to this garden together. With this I commit you to the dear Lord's keeping. Great, uh, greet Aunt Lena and give her a kiss for me, your loving father, Martin Luther. He just had a wonderful imagination and was happy to use it for inspiring uh, his children and others besides. He also, in the same year that he married, wrote one of his most important uh, theological works entitled The Bondage of the Will. So this is in 1525. He actually wrote it in response to a Renaissance scholar whose name was Desiderius Erasmus. Many of you have heard of him. He was one that Luther deeply appreciated and respected Erasmus throughout his life because Erasmus is a true Renaissance uh, scholar, had done a great deal with the sources, especially the Greek sources of the Bible, and actually provided the best sort of uh, reconstituted Greek manuscript available at the time. And so Luther deeply appreciated that and made heavy use of Erasmus' work in that regard. But Erasmus was kind of a cautious intellectual. And he took that approach, which is common among some folks like that, that they never wanted to reach a conclusion unless they were forced to do so. He always wanted to be a little bit reticent to reach convictions on anything. And he'd written a book uh, having to do with the freedom of the human will, kind of dealing with this whole question of how free is the human will and God is sovereign, that whole uh, conundrum that you under understand is, is part of theological and philosophical discussion. And basically where Erasmus came out on this was that we just don't know. It's just a mystery and so let's not try to figure it out. We're just gonna kind of leave it there in, in the kind of a myster mysterious status. Luther wouldn't abide that. He was a man who believed that, you know, part of what the uh, nature of the Christian faith is, is making assertions. He says, opening this book, the Holy Spirit is not a skeptic, you know, and he kind of plows right in and gives us one of the most powerful uh, arguments in favor of the bondage of the human will untouched by grace that's ever been written in human history. Uh, he uh, argues that the only thing that brings us to salvation is the sovereign intervention of God's grace, and aside from that, we are lost irrevocably and hopelessly. If you're not catching my drift yet, he made an argument here for predestination that was on steroids. I mean, it was a powerful case. Uh, Luther was a Calvinist, you know, but Calvin was a Lutheran. Uh, these two guys on this issue were on absolutely the same page. Lutheranism kind of departed from Luther's robust commitments, and so we don't think of the Lutheran tradition so much as we do the Reformation, or the Reformed tradition, which we represent as Presbyterians, as being so strong on this point. 
But Luther himself was very strong on the point, and we in the Presbyterian tradition have never apologized for it either, but we tend to trace our heritage back to John Calvin. Both Calvin and Luther really were relying heavily on Augustine, and Augustine was the first great theologian in history uh, to really develop this. So anyway, this book came out, and it was a defining book for the Reformation and certainly uh, made it very clear where Luther was on that point. So that was in 1525. In 1529, he wrote, uh, he wrote many hymns. He was quite a musician. He was a very fine singer. In fact, he put himself through college by singing out in public, kind of like a public musician or a, a, you know, like a beggar musician kind of thing you know, with the, with the uh, guitar case out in front and people would throw money into it as he would sing for them. That's how he went through college. But, uh, but anyway, he um, uh, uh, wrote many hymns, but the one by far the most famous, of course, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And how can you tell the life of Martin Luther without just hearing these words once? So if you'll uh, let me do this. He wrote the uh, music and the words both uh, based on Psalm 46. The origin of the hymn seems to have been a military enterprise that was being commissioned in that part of the world to go against some Islamic forces not too far away but that's been disputed, so it's not altogether clear, but it seems it was something written for the purposes of inspiring military forces. But these words, of course, have been immortal. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devil's fills should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, ha, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Amen. The same year that he wrote uh, A Mighty Fortress, there was what was called the Colloquy of Marburg. There's an interesting episode in the history of the church. There was by this time, this is now about 10 to 12 years into the Reformation era, um, and there was a separate sort of reformed movement happening in Switzerland. So we have the German Reformation and about the same time this developing Swiss Reformation. The leader of the Swiss Reformation was named Ulrich Zwingli. John Calvin eventually became the leader, but he is not on the scene yet. He may not have even been converted yet. It's unclear the precise year of his conversion, but it wouldn't have been much before this and was probably after. So these are the two sides, and there was some deep interest in trying to get the two sides together because wouldn't it be better if the Reformation could proceed, as it were, on one page and have a united Re Reformation front instead of one that was divided and became fragmented. And so there was a colloquy, as it was called, that took place at Marburg, which is a city there in, in uh, not far really from uh, where Luther lived, and it was an attempt to join these two forces. This uh, turned out to be a very interesting time together. They had mapped out in advance 15 theological propositions. And they thought uh, if they could get uh, consent on these 15, that that would do it. That, that would kind of bring the two sides together. Luther was there with his right-hand man, whose name was Philip Melanchthon. And Zwingli was there with his right-hand man, whose name was Echolampadius. And so the, two of, the four of them, and then quite a few others besides, were all meeting in little chambers and rooms and so on and negotiating and slicing and dicing their theological views. And after a while, they came down to 14 of the 15 points they were agreed. And there was only one sticking point. And many of you know that sticking point. What was it? 
Anybody know? Herm, you know. Where's Herm? I thought I saw him there. Anyway, communion, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it was, uh, Phil knows too. He knows all this stuff. If I'm ever absent, Phil's going to cover the class for me, right? And, uh, and uh, so anyway, transubstantiation, although that's the Catholic view, but Luther had a related view, a kind of similar view uh, that has been called, Luther didn't call it this, but it's been called later consubstantiation. Luther's view was that in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Christ is somehow physically, corporeally present. He rejected transubstantiation, saying that it involved a superfluous miracle, that it was more kind of lent to the superstitious outlook of the uh, Middle Ages. He repudiated that, but he said, as we receive the sacrament, that we are receiving the actual presence of Christ physically conceived in that. Zwingli, of course, took an opposite view. He took the, what was called the memorial view, that the purpose of the sacrament was simply to remember the work that Christ had done. Do this in memory of me, you see. And the two sides couldn't get together on that. It was a very interesting conversation. We had a lot more time. I'd like to explore it more deeply, but just for now, I'll just say that Luther finally got so frustrated with the whole thing that he famously began just chanting in Latin, hoc est corpus meum, hoc est corpus meum, meaning this is my body. Not represents, not symbolizes, not memorializes or anything. This is my body. And Luther would not back away from that. And so, unfortunately, I suppose you'd say, uh, the two sides were not able to get together, and so the Reformation had to proceed more or less independently, and it became more or less nationally based. Each country that embraced the Reformation had its own, as it were, reformed movement that began within it, and the Lutheran and Swiss side were not able to, were not able to be brought together. There's an interesting anecdote. I don't know if it's true, there is some scant evidence to support it, but I don't think anyone has ever figured out if it's, if it's legend or if it actually happened, but at least the, the uh, suggestion is that sometime later, some years later, Luther came across a tract that had been written by John Calvin on Calvin's view of the Lord's Supper, which would be the tradition that we Presbyterians would embrace. And at least the suggestion is, and again I'm being very tentative here because I don't think anyone knows for sure, but at least the suggestion has been that when Luther read that tract, he said, you know, if this had been the view that had been argued at Marburg, I wouldn't have had a problem with it. Uh, Calvin was much closer to Luther's view than was Zwingli. And so a Calvin, who has a very deep and profound view of the sacrament, and by anybody's estimates, it's probably the most subtle and impenetrable in some ways. There's deep mystery there. Nevertheless, seems to have said whatever was necessary, at least allegedly, that Luther would have been okay with it. So there you are. I don't know the true answer, but I'll leave that for your own thoughts. A discussion of Luther wouldn't be uh, fair without at least discussing what is probably uh, the biggest black eye that people tend to have. Anyone I've ever met who doesn't like Luther will, it'll only take them about 10 seconds to mention Luther's anti-Semitism. So I thought, well, I'm just going to take that head on and give you my thoughts on it. Uh, I'm not going to try to speak uh, too much in his defense at this point, uh, but I think at the same time the point has been overstated. So I'm going to try to be balanced here, and you may or may not buy my presentation. I, I, I think it is a tragic thing, and part of what's made this such an important point is that uh, many of you know uh, Adolf Hitler liked to quote Luther. Uh, some of his uh, more unfortunate comments as a justification for his own uh, uh, maniacal anti-Semitism. Well, that was certainly not a fair use of Luther. Uh, the very fact that, that Hitler could find anything at all in, in Luther's writings to quote, of course, is unfortunate. But I'd like to make some comments. I hope you don't think I'm working too hard at this, but I'm going to give you at least some thoughts. I think, first of all, that it's what I'm going to call anachronistic judgmentalism. We have a certain sensibility to the use of language in the 21st century that nobody had. Nobody in the 16th century, period. You wouldn't find anybody who would meet contemporary standards of political correctness on racial language in the 16th century, 
period. Not the Pope, not any cardinals, not any reformers, nobody. It's a simple fact. Now, that doesn't justify abusive language, but I'm just saying to you that it's real easy to get all kind of on the moral high ground in the 21st century and take that standard when we've had the benefit, so to speak, of all of the bloodletting that happened in the 20th century and the Holocaust and all of this, we've learned some lessons that they hadn't necessarily learned. And so for us to go back in a kind of, you know, a moralistic, judgmental attitude and condemn everybody else because they didn't quite get it the way we do, I think is a little unfair. So that's my first observation. That, that, that doesn't get him off the hook entirely, but I think it's at least worth noting uh, at the outset. Secondly, when Luther wrote and used the word the Jews, which he did, we tend immediately to view that in racial terms. At the time, however, and if you read Luther in context, it's perfectly clear, I mean perfectly clear, that he's not addressing this to a racial segment of population at all. It is a term defining a religion. The same kind of thing would happen when people would speak of the Arabs. And they meant by that the Islamic world. It was not a racial epithet but it was a common way of using language, you see. And so, again, Hitler could find plenty of evidences of Luther talking about the Jews, but I'm saying that if you read those comments in their context, it became quite clear that Luther was referring to people who were some of the most intractable and embittered enemies of the Christian gospel in the world. And he's responding to their religious attack on the Christian gospel, but he refers to those attackers as the Jews. And so you get that unfortunate ambiguity that, of course, gives us a slightly different impression of what was really going on. It also ignores entirely the many things Luther wrote which were of a completely different spirit. There's a few select quotes that a guy like Hitler could use, but he interestingly ignored a whole lot of what Luther said and so I'd like to give you at least one representative quote from Martin Luther. Quote, If I had been a Jew and had seen such dolts and blockheads govern and teach the Christian faith, I would sooner have become a hog than a Christian. They have dealt with the Jews as if they were dogs rather than human beings. They have done little else than deride them and seize their property. When they baptize them, forcibly here, when they baptize them, they show nothing of Christian doctrine or life, but only subject them to popishness and monkery. If the apostles, who were also Jews, had dealt with us Gentiles, as we Gentiles deal with the Jews, there would have never been a Christian among the Gentiles. When we are inclined to boast of our position as Christians, we should remember that we are but Gentiles while the Jews are of the lineage of Christ. We are aliens and in-laws. They are blood relatives, cousins, and brothers of our Lord. Therefore, if one is to boast of flesh and blood, the Jews are actually nearer to Christ than we are. If we really want to help them, we must be guided in our dealings with them, not by papal law, but by the law of Christian love. We must receive them cordially, permit them to trade and work with us, that they may have occasion and opportunity to associate with us, hear our Christian teaching, witness our Christian life. If some of them should prove stiff-necked, what of it? After all, we ourselves are not all good Christians either. You know. And what I'm saying to you is that's not all that unusual in his writings. So while you can be highly selective and make a case for his anti-Semitism, for my money, it's a little bit unfair. And so I'll just leave it at that. But if that ever comes up, you might want to keep that in mind. All right, we just have time to kind of finish up his life. He died in 1546. These are the last two or three letters he wrote. First two of these to his wife. To my dear wife, Catherine Luther, doctor, spouse at Wittenberg, or keeper of the pig market, my gracious wife, who I am bound to serve hand and foot, grace and peace in the Lord. My dear Katie, you should read the gospel according to St. John in the small catechism of which you once said, everything in this book has to do with me. You are warring in God's stead as if he were not almighty. He could create 10 Dr. Martins if the old one were to drown in the river or be burned in the fire or be caught in the wolf's bear, uh, bird traps. Do not plague me any longer with your worries. 
I have a better warrior than you and all the angels. He lies in a manger and clings to a virgin's breast. And yet he is at the same time seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And therefore be satisfied. She was worried sick about her husband who she loved so dearly when he would travel. And so he wrote this letter back to uh, just uh, chastise her a bit for her worries. A week later, he wrote this letter. My dear wife, Catherine Luther von Bora at Wittenberg. Grace and peace in the Lord. Dear Katie, we hope to return home this week if it is God's will. God has manifested such grace here for the Lord's through three counselors have become reconciled on all but two, to all but two of three points. On two, of, well, whatever that says, you can read it. I send you the trout given me by Thomas Albert. She is delighted with the reconciliation. Your little sons are still at Mansfield. Jacob Luther will take good care of them. Here we eat and drink like lords. Every attention is paid to us. In fact, so much so that we might forget you at Wittenberg. Moreover, the stone does not trouble me. He had severe kidney stones through much of his life, and they became just uh, awful uh, toward the end. He was in somewhat difficult health at this time. Uh, just three days later, the day of his death, uh, this was uh, his last written prayer. He wrote it early that morning. He died later that day. Quote, I thank you, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that you have revealed your dear Son to me in whom I have believed, whom I have loved, whom I have preached, confessed, and trusted. My Lord Jesus Christ, I commend my little soul to you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I know that even though I am separate from this body, I shall live with you forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our God is a God of salvation and to guard the Lord belongs, escape from death. And he died about 5 p.m. that day. A horseman rode back to Wittenberg, interrupted the class that was being taught by Philip Melanchthon, who said these words on hearing the news of Luther's death. This was taken down verbatim. Quote, Alas, gone is the horseman and the chariot of Israel, it was he who guided the church in the recent era of the world. It was not human brilliance that rediscovered or discovered the doctrine of the forgiveness of sin and of faith in the Son of God, but God, who raised him up before our very eyes, who's revealed these truths through him. Let us then hold dear the memory of this man and the doctrine and the very memory in which he delivered it to us. Let us then live more virtuously and remain alert to the grievous affliction which are bound to follow on the wake of this loss. I beseech you, Son of God, O Emmanuel, crucified and risen for us to save, preserve, and protect your church.